the only funny guy that likes those rings. Now, I'm just asking that people uh, leave space for people to come in, so it's tightened up so you can walk in and you can have a lot of space. Um, hi, I'm Rob. And uh, who are all Rob. All right. So this is Leaders Connect. And uh, so the first thing we're going to do is connect with somebody you don't know. So look around you. And for somebody you have not met before, well, say hi and introduce yourself. <laughs> All right. Thank you. We're going to keep moving out. I'm going to clap to you. Can you hear me clap twice? You hear me again, clap three times. All right, enough networking now. Hi, my uncle. Well, this is the spirit. We want people talking to each other and meeting each other and hearing about cool things that are going on. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, Richard Chang, please come up. Because we're going to talk about one other cool thing going on. Where's Richard? Richard Chang, is he here? No, oh, he's not here. Oh, come on up here. Yeah. Come on up and give you. So I'm Rob Pasek, and I know most of you, and I'm, I'm delighted to see so many people turning out for this uh, special event uh, honoring uh, the uh, life of Martin Luther King and hearing about his impact. And uh, for those of you that don't know me, I do a few things. I'm an author, uh, I'm a professor part time at the University of Michigan. Mostly what I do is uh, executive coaching, and I, I also do play groups. And people probably have not heard about this, but I, I invented it yesterday. It describes, <laughs> it describes what I do. So I have, you know how plays are in three acts. So I have an act one group, and that's made up of young people who are just launching their career. And I do groups, and I teach a lot about how to get started, uh, how to successfully onboard in your job, how to select the right job, all those kind of things. I have an act two group, which is uh, for people who are full on in their careers and are trying to you know, compete and get ahead and grow businesses or grow their profession or whatever it is. And that's, these are peer groups where people get together and it could be considered group therapy for executives, it could be considered play therapy, depends on the day, right? So but we do a lot of that. And then act three, and there's a few people in here who are in that group are people who are transitioning, done with their major job and their major accomplishment, but still want to give back and figure out what they want to do with their life. So uh, that's where it really gets interesting. All the drama comes in and I'm free. I'm looking at you. I'm talking about you. And uh, so that, that's very exciting. And I get a chance to work with a lot of cool people like Richard Chang. And Richard, maybe you could tell us just what, what you're up to and what, what you're looking for from the group. Uh, as Rob said, hello everyone. Uh, happy New Year. Hello. Uh, my, uh, my day job is actually CEO of a company here, product development firm here called New Foundry. Uh, but outside of that, I'm involved in quite a few different organizations. Uh, one of them is actually I'm the 2019 chair of the Ann Chamber. And uh, one of our initiatives for 2019 is to focus on workforce development. And as a result, if you mark this in your calendars, we'd love to have all of you attend. It's uh, Monday, March 18th. We're actually holding a Workforce Pipeline Summit. And the mission behind that is to really look and figure out uh, how to strengthen our community by alleviating what, we, what we're seeing as a short and long-term uh, viable workforce problem we have in this community. Uh, and one of those is actually shining a light and being aware of and really engaging what we're terming as a hidden talent pool. Uh, so these are folks like uh, underserved, underprivileged, veterans, 55 and older, prison pipeline, neurodiverse, and the list goes on. And it's not just focusing on uh, our typical knowledge workers that come out of the University of Michigan, which is important, but there's a lot of open seats that we have uh, across all different industries that we need to tap into. Otherwise, things aren't gonna look very good for us moving forward. And so we'd love to have your voice in. We're gonna have uh, policy makers here from local counties. Oh. Because they're charging the barbecue <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Julie. Uh, oh, perfect. All right, yeah, so what we're having as attendees are policymakers from the local uh, county and state governments. Uh, we're going to have educators from K-12, superintendents, principals, students, 
Uh, and then business owners are a very important component to that. And we would have uh, executive directors and other members of social services because they're also part of this uh, solution that we're looking for. And the end result will actually be creating a two, five, and 10 year action plan because basically it's going to be based on a vision of like what do we want to look like in 2030, which is in that far along. So, so where, where, where is this day in, in time? Yeah. You can tell, you tell uh, it's Monday, March 18th, it's being held at Washington Community College in the Morris Lawrence Hall. Uh, there is a website that's going to be launched hopefully this coming Monday. It's just workforcepipeline.org. Okay. So it'll be Thank you. Thank you. And, I, and I, this event has uh, been going on for 20 years, and we have uh, some great sponsors. So I'd like to uh, invite Chris Singh and, and Mike Cole, and I apologize for left out, but uh, Zingerman is one of our sponsors, uh, and Raymond uh, Financial Services and the Bank of Van Arbor. So uh, we're really grateful to you, and maybe you could talk about what you're up to. I hear you went to a hockey game the other day. I did. Did the, did the wings win? <laughs> Oh, all right. And after they left, they scored three goals and then they won. So that was. <laughs> <laughs> and I got home early without traffic. So that worked out. Welcome, Happy New Year, everyone. Um, I am here on behalf of Raven, which is a wonderful regional CPA and financial services firm with one awesome office here in Ann Arbor. I am joined by a couple of my colleagues. I saw Daniel over there. Thank you, Daniel Clark and Michelle Hampton. Thanks for getting up early with us this morning. Raymond does a lot of wonderful things, and Debbie Crone, my, my former colleague, and I'm so happy to see you. <laughs> Raymond does a lot of wonderful things for our clients. One thing we are doubling down right now is tax season. And then since the uh, government is shut down, unfortunately, as you all know, it's not a shutdown from filing or paying your taxes. There also are a lot of changes going on. No one's tax return here will be the same as last year. So I wanted to let you know, we brought, I brought this postcard. There's some there on the on the counter. It's a, an electronic link to, to all of the tax changes, and so Raymond's all over this. We're very happy to help, and feel free to grab this and, and find the website to go get more information. Oh, and Adam. Adam's here, too. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, good morning. Great. Um, I'm Michael Cole with the Bank of Ann Arbor. I head up a group there that's called the Technology Industry Group, so we work with tech, life science, venture capital firms helping those kind of companies and that whole community grow here in southeastern Michigan. So very honored to do that. And of course, the bank has been born and raised here in Ann Arbor. And we help people with buying homes and growing their businesses and making investment choices and things like that. Uh, so really honored to, we've been a long time sponsor here with Rob and Leaders Connect. Um, and I'm working with Rob here too on Leaders Connect Detroit program. That's kind of a uh, little something that we're brainstorming on and been working on for a couple years here. Um, and as a community bank, just really honored to have the opportunity to, to sponsor events like this and be involved with organizations in the community, uh, such as the Hands On Museum, Leslie Science and Nature Center. I see Etta here. Etta, there she is. So I've really had a, a, the honor to be involved with that organization for a number of years. And we started a a group, uh, an event there called Tech Twilight that's been running for 10 years now. It brings kind of tech companies into the hands-on museum one night a year so that they can kind of show off their cool stuff to all the families that show up at the hands-on museum. Um, so if you didn't know, the hands-on museum and Leslie Science and Nature Center merged uh, a couple years ago. So they're one organization um, and they're, they've got a, a program now called Unity and Learning. They're working with the Yankee Air Museum on uh, kind of STEM education programs. If you want to learn more about it, Etta can tell you all about it. So uh, thanks for showing up this morning. Uh, looking forward to the program. It's a great program every year. Now, other yeah. sponsor is Zingerman's. We have a member of the Zingerman's <laughs> family. So you want to stand up, Paul, and uh, say hi. You're going to be part of the panel as well. But what's happening to Zingerman's lately? Welcome, everybody. Uh, uh, thank you for coming here. We we're, we're really enjoy that you've been doing this for a long time. A long, years. long time. Yeah. 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 That's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> there will be more. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And so it's, it's a great uh, event. Actually, the way things work is, just so you understand, we're all kind of working together. We're not doing this out of our heart, just the goodness of our hearts. But you get an idea, you come to Zingerman's, and, and you, you write out the idea. And then uh, you call me, and I meet with you at Zingerman's to make the idea really come to life. And you do it over good food. And then you make a lot of... Uh, financial decisions 
so that uh, you borrow lots of money from Mike. Mike <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, you got to figure out what to do because the you know the mattress is getting full of money. You, know, you just got so much money coming in that you don't know what to do. So you go to Chris, and Chris will help you not have to give it to the IRS and how to manage it, so that you can get old and then figure it all out over again by coming back to Zigerman's and meeting with me and talking about the rest of your life. So that's how it all works here. And, and it's a simple story. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, a couple other announcements. We had a great program this year, and I've got a lot of the people already scheduled. So on February 8th, uh, Rich Sheridan, who many of you know Rich Sheridan? Almost everybody knows Rich. Uh, well, he and I were actually we were at, uh, at Beast, the Bistro last night doing uh, the, uh, the big dinner for, uh, what do they call it, Restaurant Week. Yeah, so, and uh, enjoying ourselves. And uh, Rich is going to be presenting on his new book, called Joy Inc., or the old book is called Joy Inc., but the new is uh, about CEO uh, of, of a Joy Company. I don't have the exact title. Chief Joy Officer. Chief Joy Officer, okay. Yeah. That's almost better than your title. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna be Chief Play Officer. That's okay. And then in March, we've got, we're gonna focus on uh, teens and young adults and a lot of the challenges that they're facing. We're gonna actually have a panel of teens and young adults. And um, some of them, all of them actually, I work with Beth. Beth, can you say hi? Beth is uh, my able uh, associate. And uh, we've been working on a book which the kids have titled I Aware. And it's a book for young adults, well, it's mostly for high school students about trying to figure out who you are. And, uh, and they've adapted my book, which is called Self Aware, and it's written more for college students and adults. They've adopted it to high school students, and we're publishing it. It, it will be out uh, next, well, it'll be out by March. Let's just say that for sure. So we're going to bring it and talk about the experience because my college students in my class help the high school students to write the book. So we're going to talk about the whole experience and talk about the, the, the various challenges that are facing uh, these, these kids today. And I know you've all had. Uh, scary moments with your kids and uh, hopefully everything's working out, but it's been a tough time for, for children to, uh, to make that transition. Uh, in April, uh, Doug Schneider, who's a CEO and uh, has just written a new book, and he'll be talking about his book, and it's called 10 Marathons, but it's actually 10 uh, crucibles about his, his business career and how he uses uh, running to de-stress, but he's a great storyteller. He's gonna be talking about how he took a Foundering, com foundering company and brought it to a point where it went public a couple of years ago. And uh, talk about his, his experience. He's in Cincinnati. Uh, Doug Armstrong, Doug, you're here, right? And Doug is going to be presenting on uh, nonprofit management. And he's going to be presenting with uh, food gatherers. Ellen is going to be part of it. And we may be looking for some other uh, people who talk about what does it take to run a nonprofit, <laughs> and what's the business side of it? I know it's not a business, but uh, what actually goes into making it happen? Yeah, and Doug, um, how many years? Eight years, Doug, for that to come, the dream to come true? Few more. Ten. <laughs> <laughs> Doug had this dream, and I know I've been talking to him about it, but for, for over ten years, he had the dream of making a camp that kids who don't normally go to camp because of their medical problems could go to camp for at least a week. And um, he actually made it happen. He and his team made it happen. I know it's not just you, but uh, I had a chance to visit last summer and actually we, we might do one of these Leaders Connect out there on one of your rope courses or something. It's kind of fun. <laughs> and now it's available uh, to kids, but he also is developing it as a corporate retreat center because it's a beautiful spot out by uh, in Pinky, right? And I'm 30 minutes from town, so it's a great spot if you want to do a retreat, you want to have some place for people to see beautiful nature, and actually they've got some uh, obstacle courses and things like that, so you can talk to Doug about that. Uh, in June, uh, we're gonna do one on women leaders in science, and uh, Elka's, uh, Elka Lipka of TSRL, who just took over as uh, owner of that company, is gonna be leading that. We hope to have maybe Kelly Sexton, who's the new tech transfer person, and several other of the uh, executives who are running science-based businesses in Ann Arbor. and talking about the special challenges of what does it take to be a woman to lead a business, and particularly women in science. Uh, in October, Mike Cole, 
is going to be doing work. Mike right there. He's going to be leading a panel on the financial life cycle of a company. So talking about what do you do when you're first starting, how do you get your, your money to just get it rolling, how do you ensure you don't abuse your credit cards too bad, and how do you use a bank, uh, how do you use relationships, all the way through through venture, uh, through angel funding, through venture funding, uh, through the sale of a company or whatever. So you're going to have a panel on that, Mike, right? You know who else on the panel yet? Or you're, we'll pull that together. Put it together, yeah. okay. Uh, I think also in September, uh, it's to be announced, but there's two people that, I've, that have said they're going to do this, and I'm going to put them on the schedule. One is Google, and uh, they're working on trying to get us to come there to do the event. They have a, a beautiful auditorium, so uh, we're finding out what Google's doing in Michigan. The other person I talked to yesterday was Red Berenson, who said he would come here and talk about his uh, experience as a leader of a hockey program for many, many years. So uh, Red, it's, it's a great honor to meet him. I just met him yesterday. Really cool guy, one of my heroes. And then uh, in November, uh, Tim Lynch, who is the uh, UM Chief Legal Officer, friend of all of yours, is going to talk to us about what does it mean to be the legal officer of U of M and all the uh, hot button legal issues that are going on these days and how he's been a leader here. He's been in this sixth year now and he's going to be talking about his leadership lessons and also you know, what, what are some of the tensions that, that exist. And, uh, we, we feel very uh, fortunate to have a situation here that is, is good. We've been able to stay mainly out of uh, jams. And you know, we look at our sister school up, up the road, and we know what a, uh, how fast the problem can, can develop into a total uh, train wreck of a situation. So uh, Tim will be talking about that. And we're also open to other ideas. If you have people, we're pretty much scheduled for 19, but if you have ideas for 2020, let me know. Uh, who you might like to have to speak. So without further ado, I'd like to bring up the panel and uh, have people come up and we're going to get started. So first of all, I wanted to uh, introduce Sonia Jacobs. And uh, Sonia is, uh, you know, let her talk a little bit about her own background, but We've known each other for about five or six years, I think. And Sonia, when I met her, was uh, head of uh, training and development at the medical center. And now she is doing a similar role at the first in her uh, in the world, I guess, the first time they ever they, they created this role. And maybe you could say exactly what it is, but it's, it's taking in charge of the whole training and education of staff and faculty. So it's a, it's a really cool thing. And Sonia is from uh, Detroit, right? Yes. Detroit. Right, right, right. Detroit. Paul and I are, and uh, so uh, are you Detroit? Or Buffalo. 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 It's just the same thing. Among the mistakes on the Great Lakes. <laughs> <laughs> so Sonia, I'm going to turn this over to you and uh, let you go from here. Sounds good. Thank you, and good morning to everyone. Good morning. Good morning. So I'm Sonia Jacobs. I'm the Chief Organizational Learning Officer for the University of Michigan as well as the Director of Faculty and Leadership Development at Michigan Medicine. So yes, we first met um, in the executive coaching space, um, well, uh, in my role <laughs> uh, at the medical school. And it is a real honor to be here this morning uh, to engage in a conversation around the impact that Dr. Martin Luther King has had on our lives. Uh, I had the great fortune of being here uh, last year and uh, Marvin and I had a very interesting uh, conversation uh, at the conclusion of it. Because uh, if you look at the panel uh, last year, everyone looked like me. And Marvin said, Sonia, we've got to do something different. And I said, I agree. Because we have to engage everyone in this conversation. Uh, that's how we will move forward. So I really appreciated the conversation that we had and Rob's willingness uh, to look shake it up. It and look where it got me. And look where it got Be careful <laughs> of what you may recommend and the ideas that you do. We also did tell you last year that his daughter was going to have twins. So it's a <laughs> congratulations on that. So thank you all very much. And as I said, we do want to have a conversation. I'm going to ask each one of our uh, panelists to introduce themselves. And we're going to talk a little bit about how Dr. King's life has influenced them. 
some of the challenges that they face, the actions that they've taken as a result of that influence. I want to engage you all, too, in a conversation about what you think we can do uh, moving forward. And then um, also talk a little bit about uh, your lived experiences. And that's what you're going to hear uh, from them. And there's an audience member, too, that I'm going to call on when we get into the audience portion of it, because he has a very uh, interesting story related to uh, his opportunity uh, to be in the presence of Dr. King. I always uh, like to start off by talking about my experience and my knowledge around it. I wasn't born then, but I was truly influenced because my father participated in the organizing, the organizing of the Great Walk uh, on Freedom, or to Freedom, that was here in Detroit. June 23rd, 1963, it was uh, organized down at Cobo Hall, and it was the practice run for the Great March uh, on Washington. And ever since that experience, my father's no longer here, but he really instilled in us the need for activism, uh, to have our voice, and to not let anything uh, hold us back. And so I'm very appreciative for that. And I think that that has been really instrumental in helping me get to uh, where I am. But not all about me this morning. I want to uh, have my colleagues uh, introduce our that way. Okay, so <laughs> we'll start with Marvin. Okay. <laughs> Remember, you asked for it. Uh, good morning, and uh, glad you're all here. Uh, so. Um, for many, my primary uh, career has been at the University of Michigan, but I grew up in New York City, grew up in the, in the South Bronx, uh, and I was thinking of the influences uh, on my life. You know, I had, uh, you know, my immigrant family from uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, my father was a communist, so I grew up with a lot of uh, political discourse around the dining room table. Uh, and I went to City College in New York uh, in the 60s, which was, as most of you know, a time of great uh, upheaval, both uh, related to issues of uh, race and equality and uh, uh, civic unrest around uh, the war in Vietnam. Uh, and I was very engaged in a lot of political activity in that period, and in particular, <coughs> Uh, at City College, we went through a large uh, protest to um, get the City University to promote an open admissions policy. So I was thinking of that as a, of that whole period of my life uh, had a lot of uh, influence on my perspectives. Um, my background is in social work, so a lot of my orientation was to uh, kind of how people engage in their social world, ranging from families to organizations to society. And I was very, I've had a very fortunate life at the University of Michigan. Uh, I came here uh, as a graduate student in social work and psychology. I worked in counseling and psychological services for years. I uh, was assistant director of housing and did a lot of work there on developing, I had, I had one of the earliest diversity committees, uh, and I had many wonderful colleagues who helped me with that. But then I moved over into the research world. So a lot of you would know I worked as associate vice president for research for many years and led a lot of the engagement in how the university commercializes research. I was uh, chairman of the board of the Chamber of Commerce, who is the current chair, um, for a while, and did a lot of work in that community. So I, I really had a fortunate time. I've allegedly retired from the university, but I'm working uh, half-time uh, with something called the Alliance for the Arts and Research Universities, which is really about the importance of creativity and disciplinarity. But throughout all of those experiences, my early experience around social justice, uh, and I don't know if we should talk a little bit about Martin Luther King, because I, I grew up uh, really um, in that period of time, you know, Martin Luther King was a larger than life figure for those of us who had any inclination and orientation to social justice. To have someone who was that articulate and what was of value to me was the integration of, of social justice, equality, 
nonviolence and in essence a kind of love of humanity. And I, I feel today in particular we are, we are so desperately in need of the restoration of that aspect of social justice and equality uh, that has the, the kind of affect that he had uh, around engagement and caring. And so, I mean, that, again, I feel I, I've had a fortunate life. I've had the opportunity to, to use that part of myself in, in a lot of the work I've done. Uh, but I keep thinking that was a big part of what influenced me and shaped my thinking. Even, even you know, the, the um, protests in the 60s and, and the effort to have open admissions at the, at the City College really influenced a lot of my thinking about uh, also um, honesty and transparency about change. Uh, because a lot of my concerns going forward have been about uh, hypocrisy, uh, to be honest, and kind of institutions uh, that want to look like they're doing the right thing, and people want to look like they're doing the right thing, but that's not the same as doing the right thing. So that's just giving you a piece of where I come from. Hello. 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 Um, I'm really uh, touched that I know some of you very well in this room, and the rest of you I look forward to knowing as well. My name is Lori Watanabe Saginaw. I became a Saginaw in 1976 when I married my husband Paul. So that was 40, <laughs> 43 years ago. Um, it's easier for me to go by the name Saginaw, especially in Michigan, but my, my maiden name um, has become more important to me in this decade of my life. Uh, it was never easy for people to say or spell, and it labeled me as an outsider. And so one of the things that I've realized is that my story is important for me, but it's also important for everyone. And I say that acknowledging that every single person in this room has a story that is not that different from mine. Um, so the focus of my work in the last decade has been on race dialogue which is the sharing of experiences around race. And all of us have them, no matter what our racial identity will be, because we live in a multiracial society that has been shaped by a narrative that places whiteness at the top. So um, I was born in 1951 which is six years after the end of World War II. I did not experience World War II directly, but my parents and my grandparents were all placed in prison camps during that wartime period because of their Japanese identities. Um, so that experience has shaped me, it has shaped my children, uh, in spite of the fact that we did not live through it. And I think that the connection that I make with Dr. King's example is the notion of never being a bystander. That when something is going on that is not right, to not act or not speak or not look at it or not address it is to be part of it. And so that has become more and more um, real to me in this current state that we live in, that is looked at by the entire world, that we hear more and more about every day. So the urgency to act has become more and more real 
in my in my in my brain, in my heart, in my soul. Um, what do I do? I I pick out paint colors for people, <laughs> but I also uh, lead and facilitate dialogues about race. I'm a trained mediator. I taught conflict management workshops in the Ann Arbor Public Schools. I think that I have at my core a, a belief in what Dr. King described as our, our mutual destiny and that we are all part of this, um, this journey together. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so I am uh, Paul Saginaw, and uh, along with my partner, Ari Weinzweig, uh, I'm one of the two co-founding partners of what has become Zingerman's Community of Businesses. Uh, we started in 19, March of 1982. Ari and I opened Zingerman's Delicatessen uh, with uh, the two of us with two employees. We did a little under $100 our first day. Uh, now we're a community of businesses. There's uh, 11 s separate operating businesses. Uh, there's uh, 18 <coughs> managing partners. There's three staff partners, uh, about 750 employees uh, and everything in Ann Arbor, the Ann Arbor area. My, uh, I grew up in Detroit. We went to the same elementary school. <laughs> I started a few months before. <laughs> uh, and uh, I was uh, talking before we started with Sonia that uh, when, when I was in elementary school, I was a, it was a fully integrated neighborhood and a fully integrated school. And uh, I didn't, race was not, uh, didn't seem to be an issue. It certainly was one that I was aware of uh, until 1964. And in 1963, I can distinctly remember sitting in our basement uh, on the couch and, uh, and watching Dr. Martin Luther King uh, on the steps of the uh, Lincoln Memorial. And uh, we watched it as a family, and I had this proud feeling that uh, I was, you know, part of a family that was very liberal, and uh, was was well everything that I thought I wanted it to be. Uh, the following year was in 1964. I was going to be 13. And as uh, growing up in a traditional Jewish family, was going to have a bar mitzvah. And I was sitting down at a kitchen table with my mother, uh, working out the guest list. And I had my good friend, Brent Hamilton, from across the street, who was uh, a young African-American man uh, of 13 like me. And we, you know, we grew up eating uh, at meals at each other's kitchen table. Uh, we had sleepovers in each other's house, and my mother said, uh, well, we can't invite Brent. Really? And, you know, basically, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not ready for that. And uh, I was, uh, you know, not quite 13 yet, and uh, I didn't, I guess I didn't have it in me to battle with my parents. And so I had to go and tell Brent, I had to give him some lame excuse <clears throat> as to why he wasn't going to be invited. And the, uh, the sting of that shame has never left. And as I grew a little older, I, I don't know at what point, but I vowed to myself that I'm not going to do that again. And that put me on a trajectory, a trajectory to uh, the work that I do uh, uh, and uh, 
how I brain my awareness of, of injustice to everything that I do and certainly to the organization uh, that I help found. Uh, and, and the work continues. Uh, and, uh, also, and I also remember after having left the neighborhood during white flight and moving out to Southfield, uh, again sitting on a couch, uh, distinctly remember uh, when uh, Dr. King was in Memphis uh, and uh, during the garbage strike, uh, garbage worker strike, and talking about, you know, I've been to the mountaintop, and uh, I, well, I, I remember him talking about what, you know, longevity, and I didn't know what it meant, and looking it up in the dictionary. And, uh, and but at that time, he was more radicalized and was now talking about uh, the war in Vietnam. Uh, he was upsetting the Southern Christian uh, Leadership Conference. Uh, because of a, a radical stance on that. He was talking about poverty and getting ready to organize the Poor People's March. Uh, and, and, and at that time, uh, being a junior in, in uh, high school and, and knowing, having friends whose, whose brothers had now been uh, killed in Vietnam and thinking about that and also becoming more radicalized. Uh, so uh, it was a... It was a, a very large influence on me and the work that uh, I try to continue to do and in the, in the uh, bringing uh, inclusion and equity to the organization where I do have some influence and, and working pretty hard uh, trying to uh, make that happen. Thank you very much. Uh, and Zara, I just want to start off uh, by saying talk about the actions uh, that we've taken as a result of Dr. King uh, and his influence. I didn't know it at the time, but I say I was gifted uh, with the opportunity to come to uh, Ann Arbor and the University of Michigan with um, uh, an organization, a minority-owned organization, to design and deliver diversity, equity, and inclusion training uh, for the health system which was the first opportunity that I had to meet uh, Deborah uh, in co-designing a bunch of that development. And I will tell you that a lot of my learning in that space was truly influenced by that uh, interaction. So I do just want to uh, acknowledge that. Um, and so we had a chance to really you know, build a relationship and have some really critical conversations, which is what I want to uh, encourage us to do related to our experiences, that's what's going to be required to move forward. So I want to turn it over to you to talk about how King has influenced you personally. Well, first of all, thank you, Celine. I really appreciate that. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. But just so that you know, these lights are super bright, so if we're like doing this to you, it has nothing to do with you. It's all about these lights. I'm really glad that I asked Sonia to let me go last because in listening to what everybody else has said, um, I, I'm struck at how similar, as Laurie was saying, everybody has a, a, a story and experience, and yet how very different. So I grew up in Buffalo, New York, north of Buffalo, New York, in a very conservative Republican family. The Orlowskis are notorious. As a matter of fact, my, my brother, my cousin, and I are, are the two, the three liberals of the family. And to this day, people look at us and go, where did you come from? How are you a part of this family? And, and I was born a year before um, Lori. And um, for me, our school was kind of odd in a sense because there were, we were, I was very, very aware of the fact that there were a lot of Catholic kids in the school. But there was also a lot of Jewish kids in the school. So I tell people I grew up Catholic in a Jewish neighborhood. Because for me, those two, if you know anything about those two religions, they are um, a, a, a primary tenet of those religions are you serve the community. You, you have an obligation to help other people. And one of the, th I never, my name is Orlowski. It's always been Orlowski because I wanted to honor my grandmother and my mother who have my mother. <laughs> Change her name, but uh, my grandma primarily because the whole time I was growing up, I came up with women who had this idea in their mind that we serve people, we help people 
who don't have as much as we do. No matter what we have, there are people who have less and we serve them. And, and so that was my mindset. But the other thing was, having grown up right after World War II uh, and, and being very familiar with, with people from the Jewish community, I knew people who were survivors of the Holocaust. And, and I, at some point I became always obsessed with uh, the biography of Anne Frank because I kept asking myself, not even about Anne Frank so much, but rather the people who sheltered her. Would I have the courage to do that? Would I be able to do that? I looked at the people that were my friends, I looked at people who became my second family, and I, I'd look at them and go, do, if they were, if that was the case, if they were the ones that were literally being hunted, would I have the courage to shelter them knowing that I might be arrested or murdered? I mean, I die, I die, okay, arrested, I don't like that idea, but tortured was the thing that I, you know, I was like, I'm not a big chicken. And I, and I grew up wondering that. Would I have the courage? Would I have the courage? It really wasn't until college when I, I um, had African-American roommates where I had friends who were African-Americans. And I've always been blessed to be the kind of person who someone will come into my office or my house or something. Can I talk to you? Can I, just, I, just need to, I just need to share something with you. And, and so I would hear these stories about what life was like for people about one friend who, who was in, in dental school who got flunked for a model that he made of, of, a, of a, a tooth or something when his mentor said, this is perfect, this is awesome. He was failed and his white classmate wasn't. And so I heard those stories over and over and over again. Right? And, and for us, unlike I think what um, um, uh, Marvin, thank you. <laughs> We've only known each other a long time. Uh, um, what Marvin is saying about Dr. King was radicalized for my community and the people I came from, From he was the agitator, he was the problem, he was the person that if you paid any attention to him at all, he was that guy down there who's causing trouble. So when I started to do more reading, I started to become more aware of what was going on. You know, you combine that, and I started to find out about Dr. King. Not the God on the hill, the man with the profile, that whole thing is like, you know, I have a dream and all that kind of, but the, but the real man, the man who had doubts, the man who, even amongst his colleagues, you know, um, wasn't, wasn't necessarily accepted completely because some people thought he was way too radical. Right. Stokey Carmichael thought he was way too, too calm, you know, with his whole philosophy of nonviolence, um, because Stokey Carmichael's version of, of version of life was that violence is as American as, as, America, as apple pie. So the whole notion of nonviolence was, was not radical enough for him. You know, when people were killed on Dr. when they would march, they were injured, they were killed, he suffered doubts. And, and, he was, and he was a man who was very, very human. He had faults, he had frailties. And so when I look at Dr. King's influence on my life, I have to take that hold. Would I have the courage to shelter? Would I have the courage to step out and be the only person? With Dr. King's very humanness, that yes, even though you have doubts, even though you're not a perfect human being, you still have to do that. Dr. King wanted to be righteous. Dr. King was righteous. I want to be righteous, and in order to be righteous, we have to put ourselves out there. So in, in, the, in the sense of how he's influenced me, it's that notion of Dr. King, the, my, the man in my mind, who is a very human being, who had doubts, who wasn't perfect, who, who probably you know, went through the same kind of mental machinations that my brain goes through, and yet he still did it because he had to. Rob, would you like to share uh, some of the influences? Sure, sure, yeah, I'm, sure. And uh, I, for some reason, uh, some lines from um, philosopher uh, Thich Nhat Hanh coming to my head, and he talks about um, his sorrow is so deep that his tears may fill all seven oceans, and uh, and at the same time, his joy is so bright that he can make flowers grow in the whole world. You know, and so as I think about my history with uh, not just with Dr. King, but with race relations and uh, these, these things that uh, we're talking about, I, I realize that I've had 
great sorrow over my own ignorance of things, thinking I get it, and then realizing, no, you didn't get it at all. And, uh, and at another time, thinking I'm leading, I'm really seeing change, and then being brought back to the tears again as you know, the, uh, the bad guys get elected and you know, all those kinds of things. So it just, and it, 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 some of it, I'm a great touch by Lori because that's a world, uh, Lori, I don't know as well, uh, and I, I appreciate you talking about that. The first time I heard about your experience, you were going to, uh, uh, with your mother, who's quite elderly, to uh, go back to, so I'd like to hear about the experience. You went back to the uh, detention center, is that correct? Yes. Or, yeah. So I'd love to hear Prison about that. Prison camp, right. okay, whatever it was called. But it just, and, I, and I'll just tell you one story. I, I'm always kind of bragging, oh, I was out there, I heard Dr. King speak. So I had a conversation the other day with uh, a good friend of mine. Who, we've been good friends for 40 years, and uh, his mother died when he was very young. And we were talking about all our experiences growing up in integrated schools and how we have led things and how we how we were benefited from that. And, and we both recognized that black women helped raise us. And we had never really acknowledged it because I was in a Jewish community, very, you know, working class Jewish community, but it was a big thing to have a maid. I mean, once a week. And so Mary would come to nine and a half mile in Oak Park. She'd walk all the way, I don't know how many buses it took to get to nine mile in the Wyoming area. She'd walk to our house, she'd spend the day with, at our house cleaning. And I lived with my mother and my grandmother in a 900 square foot home. So I'm thinking, why do we need a maid? It was, <laughs> but it was, a, it was a symbolic kind of thing. And I realized, so my friend said, well, his experience that he thought about it was he, the most important woman in his life was Mrs., uh, I think her name was Mrs. Burroff or something. And she was a black caretaker that took care of him after his, his mother died. And it was like when he was four to six. So I think we have these people in our lives that, well, that's only something that happens in the South. No, it doesn't. It happens all over. So that, I felt ashamed that I hadn't remembered Mary, and I don't know what's happened to Mary. I can't. Her name was a very common name, like Mary Smith or something like that. So I don't know. And that, that feels bad. So it's, it's kind of up and down that I have. Yeah, I, I want to touch on uh, this thing that I'm hearing the, about courage uh, and, and the need to uh, kind of put yourself out there, as well as to really uh, learn from others and their shared experiences. So, Lord, um, Rob just made mention of your going back and visiting the prison camp. Could you talk a little bit about that experience and what was it about Dr. King and his life that might have influenced that journey, if at all? Whoa, Sonia. Please <laughs> 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 um, Well, my mom is 96. Um, some of you know her. She lives in Ann Arbor. She still lives on her own. She's pretty feisty. Um, <laughs> a lot of people think she's just as cute as a button. She has done a, an excellent job of suppressing her feelings and trying to see everything in a positive light and um, it's been one of my jobs as a, as a daughter and in exploring my own identity to reconcile that that's been her way of dealing with her life. Um, I have wanted in the past for her to be a lot more angry and to be a lot more connected to her feelings about it, but um, that's me and that's, that's not who she is. But, uh, so it was very meaningful to take my two sons, who are 30 and 35, uh, with Paul and my mom and my sister and her husband and all of us to go on a pilgrimage to Thule Lake, which is the prison camp where she was sent uh, in 1943 and um, it's in Northern California just below the Oregon border 
there are 11 camps altogether, and some of them are more intact than others. Um, Tule Lake is hardly visible. There's a small marker. It's been designated as a historic um, park. But it was, uh, it was probably the biggest gift that we could give my mom to be witness to this place and to have her begin to share a little bit about um, the trauma of it. She has always been very open and willing to talk to elementary school and high school students about the experience because it is something that is not really developed or explained very well in our history textbooks. But it's a very superficial story that she tells and it is significant that she experienced it and she's standing there in front of them and making the comparisons to what is being done to people nowadays um, because one of those camps was being considered as a place for refugee detention as well. Um, maybe someday I'll write about it. Uh, if you want to Google my mom, there is a YouTube video of her getting an honorary degree from Mills College, which was where she was going to school at the time that the war broke out, and so she was forced to leave. And I asked them um, if they would give her a degree because I felt that uh, that was something that was <coughs> taken away from her. Uh, it's very hard to compare uh, trauma and oppression. It, I have always experienced that as being a very difficult and um, frustrating and unproductive endeavor to compare people's <coughs> pain, to compare people's suffering, to compare their oppression. Uh, in my mind, what I like to think is that any experience like that is a platform for building compassion and understanding of what it is that other people have experienced. So I, I do feel that anti-blackness and the anti-black experience that is taught in this society is the primary focus and from that comes all of the other anti-ideologies that we <coughs> are schooled in. You said that your mom said the future, what is the name? The oh, totally. uh, her name is May Watanabe, W-A-T-A-N-A-B-E, spelled just like it sounds, <laughs> um, and Mills College honorary degree. You can find it. I was going to pass this over uh, to Marvin just to speak a little bit too about some of the actions that you may have taken that were influenced uh, by Dr. King's teachings. Well, you know, I think um, a lot of it uh, was uh, has to do with with both inclusion and being willing to deal with conflict and difference. I mean. I'm thinking of uh, work I've done uh, as a social worker and at the university uh, where you have opportunities to bring people together to learn um, how to work with one another. And I think uh, that for me, uh, some of the influence was recognizing that uh, you need to deal with conflict. I mean, I was thinking of, um, you know, when Deb was talking about her family or Bo was talking about his experience, um, that we all kind of have to struggle with who do we please, uh, who has influenced us, uh, how do we represent ourselves. And I found 
in a lot of situations, especially doing training or working with professional development, getting people to talk about some of the influences in their experience and to surface and identify differences and, and find constructive ways to talk about those differences. And I think um, there's been, uh, and I'm thinking back to when I was in the 60s or 70s, in some ways there was a little more honesty um, and a little more effort to uh, kind of explore and and resolve some of those differences uh, and, and for me continuing to find ways of encouraging that and of not being complacent of not avoiding things because they result in some conflict I, I keep bringing that up because I find that that in my experience uh, ends up being a real um, cloud over managing change and progress, that the degree to which we are uh, having to um, protect ourselves and promote our self-interest or be concerned with how we fit into our organization or our extended family, that these, these are challenges we all live with, but they often dull our senses or compel us to be very cautious and careful about how we express ourselves, what we confront, um, the issue you know that comes up of not stand, being a bystander to things that are problematic. And so for me, I've done a lot of work on issues related to gender at uh, you know uh, at the university, and was an early. You know, I was thinking of that. You know, I was the boy sexual harassment prevention trainer. You know, the one. Um, uh, <laughs> You know, or working on sexual assault uh, prevention and awareness. And that was another area as a man where you had the opportunity to say, knock, knock it off. It's wrong. Don't do that. You know, and, and yet there are many situations where we're, un we're still in our work lives, in our family lives, we're under a lot of pressure to conform. And I, I, it's surprising. And we're in a culture right now where there's so much tension and so much divisiveness. And uh, some people feel emboldened to speak out, uh, ironically, to, to voice what I find you know, terrible, obnoxious, hateful sentiments. But I, in a funny way, I feel those of us who don't like those sentiments don't speak up enough. And I think that's some of my current struggle, and, and this motivated me to think about that. You know, uh, what do we do in, in these times? You know, how do, how do we carry forward? Uh, even if we have, and you know, I struggle with this, so I have good values, so what? <laughs> you know, what, the, what do I do with that? And I think that's uh, harder, and depending where you are in your arc of your life and your career, it's, it's sometimes harder to know what to do with that. Can I just check, uh, how's the temperature out there? Oh, 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 yeah. Maybe ask if you can take a call. Show someone. Show someone. Show someone. Direct action. Sonia said it's okay if I add something little to what I was saying before. And I think what jumped out for me, as you were speaking, Marvin, was that going on that pilgrimage is connected to my idea of the risk of becoming a target. So when when I align myself with something that is that I feel is unjust, and I want to work at it in order to right it or to heal personally, then I put myself in a position of being a target. And I think that that's the connection to Dr. King, is his, what, what I hold so precious is his uh, willingness to be a target, to, be, to take the risk and to not be afraid to actually to intend to make other people uncomfortable. Deborah wants to add uh, to that, and I want to come yeah. back to how do we create that space 
where we can have very important conversations, being respectful, but not going to the extreme. Oh good, because this will be a great segue into that. So in, in building on what Marvin was saying, um, that I, I think that I, I've, I've looked at myself for years as being the translator. You know, I, I, in my own mind, that's how I, I get the courage. The, the, the Anne Frank thing in my head is always back there. How do, I, how do I have the courage to do that? And so I've become comfortable in the role of being a translator. Not necessarily even an ally, I don't think of myself that way, but as a translator. And that is someone, so as a white person, sometimes, you know, like one of my first jobs, I, I was one of the few white people in an office, so there were hundreds of people in social services, and there was you know three or four of, of, of the rest of us. And so I, I learned how to listen, and I learned how to notice things from people's point of view that weren't mine. And so as a translator, I now, and for years now, and it's kind of heart, heartening because at the beginning I was the only one, and now there are others who do this, who you're in a meeting, and you look around and everybody looks like me, or everybody looks like you, whoever you may be. And you go, gee, you know, how about we bring in the viewpoint of someone who's a lot younger? Or how about we bring in, you know, a man or a woman or, or a, a person of color? Or, you know, we, we hear a lot from the African American community, but we don't hear anything from the Asian community, or, and, and, which is all different too, right? Or no, you know, there's no such thing as Asian community. There's Japanese, there's Chinese, there's, I mean, there's a whole variety of people. So being that translator, and being that person who notices, I think is one way that we can do that. The other thing is, the struggle for me sometimes is keeping that sense of compassion, that that other person maybe isn't quite where you are, and, and that, because sometimes after a while, you don't really again, so it's keeping that mindset. And I have one quick story about what you may can do with, with somebody. So I was, I was in Buffalo. Um, my, my father died a couple of years ago. He was 97. He also lived on his own. Uh, apparently there's something in the water in Buffalo where you know, we live forever because it must be all the chemicals or something. I don't know. <laughs> and, and it's because my aunt and uncle are in their 90s. And you know, their anniversary, they were doing the polka. And, and it was pretty amazing. So I'm, I'm at, we were having a, a surprise birthday party for my cousin, and so I was staying with my, my aunt and uncle, and we're sitting out on the front porch, and she goes, oh, well, yeah, that house over there, that was just sold. She said, you know, this colored guy moved in. And I went, this who? And she, and she looked at me and she went, um, um, this colored man. I said, better? Okay, you want to try again, everybody? And she looked at me and she goes, um, this African-American man? And I went, great, yes, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. I gave her a hug and we continued the conversation. And for her, the fact that she saw that look on my face, she knew she'd done something wrong. She wanted to keep me happy because she loves me. She's my aunt, I love her. I mean, they're good people, right? But they don't really sometimes no, they don't think about things. And so for me in that moment, and I had a similar experience with my father about uh, the Seneca Indians who, there's a, there's a reservation south of Buffalo. So in my mind that says a couple of things. First of all, even when you're in your 90s, you know, people know people don't change. Yes, they do. They start to notice things. They, you know, everybody, when they're brought along in a compassionate way, when we see their humanity, when we see the fact that they're a product of who they are too, where, who their relatives are, how they grew up, then I think that that's a start to what Sonia is asking. And I appreciate that, where um, you created an environment where you uh, encouraged, <laughs> prompted uh, change. Uh, uh, because oftentimes we don't think people can change. It's about our conversations and where we come from, non-judgmental. I think that helps us uh, to uh, have the appropriate dialogues that we need uh, uh, to see change in the world. So I want to ask uh, the panelists, how do you go about creating environments where we can have some of these critical conversations uh, that may sometimes be painful and requires us to be courageous so that we can progress? <laughs> so
So, uh, I'm the founder of an organization, and so I have uh, an enormous amount of influence within this organization. And uh, the work that I try to do, we, as an organization, we work on, we have very long range visions. Uh, and back uh, in 1994, we came out with a, a 15 year vision and as, as, as that would take us to 2009. And as that was uh, around 2007, we were, you know, we could see that the sunset of that vision was, yeah, in the near future, and so uh, we started working on our next vision, which would take us to 2020, and all the partners, we went on a retreat, and uh, everybody worked on a vision for their own business, and then a vir vision for the community of uh, businesses, and we brought those all together and shared them, and uh, where were the common themes, and where were there some conflicts, and uh, we we worked for, for quite a while until we came out with a shared vision. We had a facilitator. Uh, this, this was hours and hours and hours of work, and we're getting ready to say, are we ready with this draft to send it out to the rest of the organization? And uh, I, I looked around the table, and, and we did all look the same. And uh, I, we never started out to say we're going to be a, an organization uh, where, where, you know, that's where the power structure is going to be uh, all white. Uh, but I realized that, you know, having a value, holding a value and wanting something is, is not the same as it, as it being actionable. Uh, and so it really, I raised the issue. I said, I hate to bring this in at the last minute, but we need to, we're not, we're not there. And uh, we need to give ourselves a mandate. Uh, and that mandate was that the, the ownership of the organization at a minimum should, should reflect uh, the demographics of the community that we do business in. And why weren't we getting there? Uh, and it really caused uh, myself uh, to, to look inward and to really see what is it, uh, what, what unconscious, uh, what is unconscious about, you know, the, the uh, where, where is there uh, institutional racism with, within the organization that I have an enormous amount of influence over? And uh, where, where is my privilege uh, you know, acting out in ways that is not uh, allowing this organization to become the organization that I would truly want to be. So uh, we we started looking, uh, working very hard on that. Uh, we, we started a work group. We came up with a, uh, a committee, and uh, looking at how do we uh, how do we recruit? How do we interview? What are our policies? Uh, where where is you know what? When, when we have these policies, what what are they? Uh, where does white supremacy come into play with the policies that we put into place, uh, and how are we going to interrupt those? Uh, and uh, so that's 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 the work that that uh, personally I've been doing. Uh, I I am my I I'm not going to I'm I'm 67, so I'm not going to be here for another 20 years. Uh, as, as a leader in the organization, but I certainly uh, would like, uh, for me, uh, I'm gonna measure success is, is that there is a legacy uh, of, in our organization that we are uh, in, inclusive and that there's equity and that everybody uh, that works in this organization uh, feels free to speak out and, uh, and, and believes that they're valued uh, and, and that they have something to contribute. So really, that's that's the work that I'm uh, focusing on. And if I can add to that, uh, because I had a, the great fortune of working with um, Paul and Zingerman in that space as they um, really thought about that vision and how to uh, embrace the community uh, that they serve. And one of the things that Paul did was roll up his sleeves. He didn't just appoint a committee, he was a part of the committee. And 
he made it really clear what the expectations were and what support he provided. And I think one of the things that for me was really impactful was you telling your stories, you know, so that people could see themselves uh, in that vision and they knew it would be tough, but they knew they had their leaders' support in, in moving forward. And so I, I applaud you uh, for doing that because it, it, it takes courage. And as a leader, we have to say, this is the direction that we are going in remove any barriers and or any obstacles uh, to achieving that. So uh, I appreciate having that opportunity uh, to work with you. Uh, Marvin or Lori, would you like to also share how you think we can go about engaging people in conversations, thinking about the uh, risk dialogues uh, that you've had? And I could imagine that in some of those dialogues, we've had some challenging conversations. How might you go about engaging people, but also managing some of those dynamics that might get in the way of real progress. <coughs> um, one of the reasons that I believe so strongly in the importance of dialogue is uh, that I think um, as a society, Race has been a taboo subject to talk about across racial identities. Um, and for white people, it's extremely taboo. There's a recent great handbook called White Fragility written by Robin DiAngelo that I recommend to everyone um, because it names what the constraints have been, that we all have experienced. Um, I think there's an underlying hunger to be able to understand race and to be able to talk about it. Um, so it is not impossible to engage around this subject. Uh, it, is, it does not have to be hostile. It does not have to be alienating. Uh, it can be just the opposite. It can be the most connecting experience. Um, we, we don't, I don't think as human beings we want to be separated from one another. Uh, but we have so many forces that are operating to cause that to happen. I, I think um, it's quite good. Uh, it, it's a challenge. I mean, I, I really think it's very hard sometimes uh, to construct the right climate for those conversations. And it's uh, what I was thinking a little bit um, maybe because of what I've been doing lately, is uh, art and uh, theater and film. And because I, I've, when, I, when I worked uh, many years ago in the, in the residence hall program, we were really at a period of doing a lot of training of our residence hall staff about diversity of all kinds. And one of the most successful things we did is create a theater troupe. Uh, it was called Talk to Us. Scott, we Scott Weissman was a social worker at the time, as a young theater student. And we, what we would be able to do is incorporate um, scenarios. And some of those had to do with race. And so you could script it, which then made it not real. So you could ask an African-American student to play a role. You could ask you know, white students to play a role. You could enact a problem. And what we would do is we'd freeze the action and then get asked the audience to respond. And I think there's something, and we all also, I think we all have the experience of looking at plays and movies that move us to think differently. Um, you know, that sometimes having that aesthetic experience, sensory experience that gets you away from your uh, kind of constructed uh, defense is often helpful. And I keep 
So I, I often have been thinking about, it's hard to get people to participate. I mean, we do all have the experience of people who want to be involved in discussions. But I think, you know, often it's harder to extend that. <laughs> and, I, and I was reminded of, of uh, that approach and trying to think of how to use that, how to use more uh, trigger, uh, I know we're not supposed to use triggers, but, um, uh, but you know, have prompts, thank you. Um, how to use more prompts to get people to free up a little more. Um, I mean, there are constructive ways that those of us who have done a lot of group work or whatnot know that you can takes time to build trust and to get people comfortable to truly disclose and feel safe doing that. And often in our current contemporary work worlds, we don't have that. We don't have the commitment to do that. I think people you know, are wary of uh, disclosure. So I think I, you know, I, I struggle with this question uh, of how to do that. I had an experience in my uh, class this semester, which is a Ross Business School class, and I had uh, 35 or so uh, Ross students and uh, seven football players. And I have a relationship with uh, Claiborne Green, who was on the panel last year. Claiborne has found my class, which is about self-awareness and preparing for careers, which would be very good for the players, especially that are going to be going off to the NFL. So it's a, it's kind of a privilege, but so these, these guys were in the class and, and they with there was separation in where people would sit. And um, I had to work all semester to kind of create an environment where they started to talk to each other, these two groups. Uh, there were a few other African American women in the class, I think two others. Uh, Carol's son was in the class, Carol's out there somewhere, but it was an amazing class, but by uh, halfway through, they started to talk to each other. And the Ross kid said, I, I've never had a class with any minorities, hardly at all. And certainly, I've never seen a football player, except on Saturday. I have no idea who you guys are. And, but the amazing thing was these players, and these are guys like Rashawn Gary and you know, going to go to the NFL. They were scared to be in that class because these are the brightest kids. This is the only time they had been at Ross. So by pairing them up and putting them in small groups, they talked on their own over the semester and really got to share you know, the, the, the feelings, which a, a lot of them were shame you know, on both sides that they hadn't had that experience. Because a lot of the kids at Ross, I call them kids that have never touched the ground. You know, they went to private schools, they got right into Ross. I mean, they've just not ever experienced the diversity, uh, at least with, with African-American or with poor people. So it was a very powerful experience, but that, that's the joy part. So then, flat, fast forward, a friend asked me to come to the engineering school and to talk to their graduating group of 400 seniors, 400, and I didn't know anybody. And so I started having the same kind of attempt to talk to those students about some of these real things. And uh, I'm sitting there laughing and stuff, and I'm thinking, this is not going well. It was a two hour talk. and. Uh, one of the things that I did in my class is I asked all students to be prepared to introduce themselves and to spell their names because a lot of times people can't understand any name, like Orlowski or Pasek, but especially when it's a name that is uh, unfamiliar to our tongue. So I asked some of the students uh, to, to spell their name when they came up on the stage. So at the end of the meeting, uh, this person, and I won't say the name, but it was an ambiguous name and it was a person that had ambiguous gender to me, said to me, uh, I'm, I wanted to introduce myself. I'm from the uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee at the Engine School. I think, great, if she's, she or he is going to ask me to come speak to them about uh, you know, my, my brilliance and my sensitivity. <laughs> and this person said, I want you to know that um, the this, this students were really offended by the way you treated these, these students by asking them to come on stage and make, make them spell their name. And I, I was shocked, and I, I, I thought I answered appropriately. But this then escalated to where I got called out by my department chair. It went all the way through the dean's office, that I had offended people. So, you know, and I, to me it was a lesson learned. Okay, I've got to learn, but the hard part is that we continue to have to learn these lessons. What language can we use? 
what, what's appropriate, what isn't appropriate, when is it appropriate. And I fear right now that what's happening is that we're, we're getting into an environment where people are afraid to take any risks and really speak about anything because the, the voice of the individual can call out and make somebody very, very uncomfortable and somebody doesn't want to say, well, I missed this, I didn't listen to the student or whatever. So we have a, on one hand, we have a very open environment and I'd like to hear you talk about this from your role because it's gotta be very, very complicated. But on the other hand, we have an oppressive environment that's a little bit like McCarthyism. So, uh, you know, how do you manage that? Right. Yeah. Give me one of the toughest questions. <laughs> 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 and, uh, throw it back out uh, to you all. I think um, you've all touched on some of the things that uh, we have to do. So I, I talk a little bit about uh, my journey, because this is a journey for all of us to create a more uh, inclusive uh, environment. We do have to uh, set the context that we're going to have some conversations, and that might be there might be some tough conversations. We've got to address the sensitivity. Um, and we also have to make it really clear that we're going to have conversations that are respectful. We create the groundwork to have respectful conversations and the willingness to call someone out on their behavior that might be disrespectful. But I do believe we all have to start from a place of intent, good intent. The people don't mean harm. We may say something that is incorrect, and we ought to be able to have the permission to uh, uh, be incorrect, but to apologize, and then learn from that. And so I, I don't want to take <coughs> too much of the mic time, because I want to hear from you. Please, go you. ahead. Yeah, we want to hear okay. from you, too. <laughs> you, you will hear from me. <laughs> <laughs> and and it, it's difficult. I, I would never say that uh, it is an easy uh, conversation. But as long as we set the ground rules, we're clear on who we are, and we share our stories, I think we open up uh, the dialogue where we can have some pretty critical conversations. But it will take a lot of courage on our part to address the behavior that is counter to what it is that we are trying uh, to create. So some of the things that we're trying to do is really start with being clear on our values. We are as leaders expressing our values, but our organizational values. So we are right now embarking upon culture change. We all know what has happened you know, up the road uh, at um, MSU, which breaks my heart because I believe dream. Uh, but at, at Michigan, being clear on our values and the what are behaviors we expect to see everyone demonstrating, making those behaviors clear at every level, and then really helping to develop people around uh, those. Also, uh, thinking about our processes. So looking at how we hire, as you uh, mentioned earlier, and making sure that um, we're thinking inclusively uh, in those uh, practices. Looking at how we are uh, giving feedback, you know, on how people are showing up with those behaviors. Just think about how all our organizational processes have to support the culture that we are trying uh, to create. And then making sure that we're empowering people to use their voice, um, to be able to you know, give feedback, but also hold people accountable. Because I don't think that we will make any change if we allow those behaviors that are counter to what we're trying to do uh, continue. So as leaders, we must uh, do that. But uh, in the interest of time, because we only have like 15 minutes. We have to, uh, we only have about 50 more minutes. Okay, great. I wanna ask you uh, in the audience, given this environment, uh, sensitivity, uh, given the environment of somewhat extreme behavior, the national climate, how do we stay true to Dr. King's teaching and his actions? What are some of the actions that we all can take to move forward and honor his legacy? I want you to take a few minutes to have some discussions amongst yourself. And then I want to hear some of the ideas that you have, and I'm going to ask our panels to add to that. So take about maybe five, six minutes to have some conversations. What can we do to continue to move forward in light of the environment that we're in? <laughs> Bye.
two people. And um, one of them is my mother, and the other is Dr. King. And they're both heroes of mine, although I learn something from everybody I meet, so you're all heroes to me. So uh, my mother was uh, Michigan, 53, um, a uh, weaver, a storyteller, a writer, um, a cook, according to the chef, actually, and uh, also a militant civil rights activist and a uh, feminist in the world her whole life, she'd known something for So I was growing up in the suburbs of Detroit and uh, you know, learned from her constantly. And she also, oddly enough, wrote a weekly cooking column in the uh, Observer Center of newspapers. I don't know, from this area? Uh, it was the Queen of Hearts, and uh, here was this militant feminist writing this cooking column. Although well, she is a professional because she was a really amazing show. So she wrote this cooking column for years and years and years, and she constantly went to her editor and said, look, I mean, I should have press credentials. I mean, I'm on this paper like any other reporter. I should be able to you know, feel like I am. And they argued, but you just write a cooking column, what are you doing? Well, fine. And uh, finally she convinced somebody, so she got her uh, press credentials. So I lived in this neighborhood with my mom, who was notorious in the neighborhood, because it was an all-white neighborhood. Uh, and uh, you know, my reputation was, oh yeah, her. You know, and uh, so one day, you know, she said, we're going to go into uh, the city and we're going to go see Martin Luther King Street. And this was at Rose Point High School, oddly enough, and it was in March of 68, about three weeks ago, where it was assassinated. And so here I was, I was 12, my sister and my brother, one older and one younger, uh, went down into Rose Point. Uh, we parked blocks away from the, um, the uh, high school. Was um, because it was just like, packed up, and it's, but the walking in those several blocks from where we parked the high school was just lined with uh, uh, angry people, and they were yelling and screaming and lots of nasty stuff about you know where we're going, who we're going to see it, and I was a 12 year old you know little guy and I'm walking along and I'm like I couldn't believe the energy coming from the sidewalk. It was very well organized this uh, protest. So we got to the gates around this high school. And uh, if you had a ticket, you could get through the gate. If you didn't have a ticket, you couldn't. So we had tickets. So we got up to the front door. And uh, the sheriff's deputy says, you can't go in. Fire marshal has said, it's too full. You can't come in. And my mother goes, yeah, but I'm with the press. I was in her car. And I don't know how she did it, but she sort of weaseled the door, pushed the three of us into the uh, auditorium, and came in behind. Now, she was five, two. Um, so we went into this room, and the electricity walking down that street uh, was even amplified in the auditorium. It was just, I, I had never experienced something where there was so much energy. Not only was Dr. King speaking, and that to me was, you know, he was a hero of mine, he was a person, I understood who he was. But the energy was just uh, unbelievably intense, and it was augmented by the fact that there were all these people yelling and screaming, all these happy. Um, and it was, I mean, it, 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 I can't ex really describe how amazing it was. But two of the things I learned from that, one, militant kindness, okay, which is something that Dr. King, he didn't ever say militant kindness, but he said militant, and he said kindness in different parts of the sentences. And to me, I was struck, because here was one gentleman, Joe something, a uh, Vietnam vet, who hated communists, thought that Dr. King was a communist, or he supported them in Vietnam. And he kept yelling and yelling and yelling. And finally, 
Dr. King, they were trying to escort him out. He said, no, 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 let him come up here, let him speak. And I'm going, that's amazing. Here's this guy who's just being rude and mean and you know disparaging. And Dr. King says, no, no, kindly. He says, come on up here, come here. And the guy says, he sounded like communist, the board, all this stuff. Um, and, and he said, okay, thank you very much. And he continued on with his talk. The other point that I remember from that speech is that he talked about the fact that many people thought change would come with time. And he goes, you know what? It's, it's, it's not going to be time. It's going to be intention. It's going to be people making a difference and changing how other people feel and what they think about and how it goes. And here we are, 50 years later, time has done shit. <laughs> okay? I mean, we're worse off in some ways than we've had in a long time. But the fact of the matter is, it's all about intention. Like, how do you talk to people? How do you um, uh, make them understand you know, how it should be, it should be a funny word, but how we would like it to be? One of the ways I do that, and it's almost a part of the trick, is to talk to people about institutional racism. Most people don't even understand that that's part of the deal. They think, I'm not racist, I'm a good person, I love everyone on the planet. But the fact of the matter is, if you can get people to understand the idea of institutional racism, they're not saying, I suck, right? They're going, whoa, the system sucks. And I think that's, to me, that's sort of been my, you know, sort of my battle cry or my sort of way to shift the conversation away from, you're a bad person, because you harbor these feelings, to look, the system's a bad system. So anyway, uh, learned a lot from that experience, and continue to learn, and Thank you. Thank you. That's one really great action, education. Okay, let's educate on institutional racism as a way to encourage conversations. What other ideas did you have? It's a simple idea, it's a short idea, and it's been said before. Elections have consequences. We need to see that we have elected officials who share our values, because that's where the power is. Amen. Thank you. Tanya, I just wanted to build on what Tanya said about education. I work at the University of Michigan, along with Sonia and uh, Marvin and Jagra. And our president, President Special, has made an effort to have diversity, equity, and inclusion be a top priority for us. And he has started with senior leadership, worked all the way through the organization, where we all have plans about how we're going to integrate this. And one of the things that's so wonderful is the training that's been developed. One of them is called Change It Up, which is a class that it's very experiential. And so if anyone would like any more information about how you can actually bring training in, and like Marvin said, it has a lot of role playing. And my experience when I went to it, I thought I was really good with this whole topic. And I learned that I said something to somebody that I thought was a compliment, only to find out that I you know, made them really upset and thought, wow, to get into somebody else's shoes is really hard to do. Well, JV and I were talking as partners and he comes from the opposite end. He's an individual um, entrepreneur, he owns his own business, and he was talking about coming to events like this being a great um, opportunity to be motivated. So again, that education theme. And he also said uh, something I thought was interesting about reminding him about history and bringing history into our present day and how we can learn from it, um, change our behaviors and things like that. Thank you, Mark, for sharing. One more, and then I need to get back to the uh, panelists for some ideas. And I'm going to move up through the rope. Hello, I'm Ray Jabber. I, I have been here a few times uh, for this event uh, about uh, Dr. King. I always hear about things, uh, what, like how he, he influenced people, what things, how were in the past and what they are right now. I like to learn more about his concepts, his principles, what made him unique, how he influenced others like you know to accept his vision and strategy and how to like, you know how he survived to be able to be influenced. Thank you. Thank you. I saw another hand. Oh, there might be some recommendations. Okay, I'm coming up. I'm moving up. Education of course is important and all it's talking is but I think it has to come down to small actions. 
not even grant actions. But you know, what, wherever you are, whatever you're dealing with, grant them personhood. Look them in the face. If they have an email, say their name, you know. Just connect with everything. Thank you, thank you. Break down, share stories, raise awareness. <coughs> so um, I have an experience when I was transitioned from elementary to middle yes, school yeah, yeah. where I experienced um, institutional racism. Um, my elementary school was kind of an underserved area. Um, when I went from sixth to seventh grade, because of the type of math system that we had in our school, when we went to middle school, they said, well, you know, that math system that you did at your school is inferior to ours. So I was placed in a fourth grade math book. So I remember going home crying to my parents and, you know, they think I'm stupid. I, I was split in a fourth grade math book. So by the time of the end of the school year, I was doing ninth grade math. I had to pass everyone in my classroom. And that experience to me taught me to, um, not that I always had to prove something to anyone else, but it made me an advocate for the underdog. Um, when, I see an issue where people are being um, treated in a way that I think is unjust or unfair. I speak up about it, and sometimes I do make myself a target, but I think it's the right thing to do, and um, I think it's a good thing from the influence of my elementary teachers that they influenced me to do my best and, and to work hard, and, um, and they told me that was smart, so that episode did not crush me. Um, it just made me excel more. Um, into adulthood. So um, I think sometimes we don't realize other people's experiences. Um, there, and, and you can get very biased by what you see in social media and the news. But really talking to people is what can really help you relate to that, to their experience. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. And I want to make sure that we have any closing ideas or thoughts from the uh, panelists. We have a chance to share those. Um, we don't have a lot of time. Uh, I, I would just go back, I think, to a lot of uh, the issue of compassion and the issue of empathy and of, of uh, real caring. And I go back <coughs> to Martin Luther King. I mean, the fact that he was able to maintain your story about letting someone speak, but that the origin of, of uh, love, compassion, and empathy uh, for other people in whatever condition they're in, I think is still essential. It doesn't mean we don't get angry. It doesn't mean we don't confront injustice. It doesn't mean we don't have conflict. But there's a certain shared humanity that we need to remember. I think that's my takeaway. And Laura has a suggestion for us. Um, last year, for the University of Michigan's MLK Symposium, there was a great keynote speaker, Hill Harper, and you can uh, get, you can enjoy his presentation on YouTube. So just Google Hill Harper MLK 2018. And he delivers the most compelling call to action about, uh, getting involved in local politics and he really challenged me to do something that I had been on the fence about. So that day as I sat there in Hill Auditorium and listened to him, I decided to apply to be on the task force that formed the Police Oversight Commission for Ann Arbor and it was I was completely blindsided, I was underwater, I was overwhelmed, it was the hardest project I have ever worked on, but also the most rewarding. And right now, we are in the process of looking to recruit and hire a new police chief. Can you imagine what a difference that could make if we were to hire an open-minded, non-racist, liberal, transparent, compassionate police chief. Uh, we also have a, an ordinance in Ann Arbor now to create 
uh, to, keep pop, to populate a police oversight commission and applications for that commission are now being accepted. They can be, the application will be found online uh, on the Human Rights Commission's website. We also need to imagine what it would be like to, to really realize the type of commission that can not only provide constructive oversight to the department, but can inform the community, can improve the relationship of youth with the police. There's so much potential. So if you have any interest in this or want any more information, I'd be happy to have breakfast with you, lunch, dinner, coffee, anything. I think about, uh, in 1955, Dr. King was asked to uh, allow a organization meeting uh, about a protest to uh, convene at his church. And that meeting is what pushed him into the movement. 1955. In 1968, he was assassinated. 15 years. I think about what he did in the, the short amount of time of 15 years, and so I try to think about what I'm doing and not doing, and it really urges me to action. And I would say, if whatever you you're thinking about doing or dreaming about doing, uh, for someone else, uh, as they, as Nike says, just do it, and that, and that, there's boldness and there's genius in just taking action. Okay, I got to do this on speed, speed dial here. Okay, uh, building on what Paul just said, let's remember that Dr. King was assassinated when he was 39 years old. His first, someone first tried to assassinate him when he was 29. When he was 27, he took over, he, he founded the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. In other words, that to me shows that there's a place at the table for everyone. Because sometimes we look at the youth today, and, oh, they're too young, they don't know, they don't have experience. Dr. King was a very young man, okay? Um, here's something personally I think that's really important for us. I learned this very early on when I was a, a member of the Women of Color Task Force. Uh, my former boss at the time looked at me and he goes, why are you a member of color, Women of Color Task Force? And another colleague went, Jimmy, white's a color. He went, oh, yeah, okay. One of the women on the, on the committee said to me, uh, when somebody said something about white people, and, and I went, well, you know what? She said, stop, stop. She said, look, if the shoe fits it, wear it. If it doesn't fit, walk away from it. In other words, when people say things like white people or men or women or whatever, think about what they're saying. We have to really try not to be as defensive. Just listen. It may not be your experience, but that's okay. Just listen. Try not to be, try not to take it personally. If it does hurt you personally, maybe that's a time for you to stop and to think, why am I being affected by this? Why is this using the word triggering me? Right? Because that could be something that there could be something in what the person is saying that there's a that there's a, a nugget of truth for me. <coughs> Finally, I, I wanted to say I want to uh, a couple of things that Dr. King said in his uh, last speech uh, in Memphis the night before he was assassinated. Now we have to also remember I think that Dr. King was not only about civil, uh, racial equity, he was about social justice. Economic equity. He was violently, well, not violently, but he was he was adamantly opposed to the Vietnam War. Right. So he wasn't just a man that was about racial justice. He was about every, every kind of injustice. And he said that in order for his followers to continue, in order for him, um, because he he had a, a vision people think now that he may this may have been his last night. He said, we need to develop a kind of dangerous unselfishness. To continue down on this road requires a dangerous altruism. And that we have to be maladjusted to the problem 
of injustice in the world. So I think that that's, for me, a good thing to continue on saying about. Thank you. I, I just wanted to thank Sonia for uh, organizing this panel and, and doing such a great job of facilitating. I want to thank Marvin and Lori and Paul. And There's food here to take back uh, to, to your coworkers or to your family. Uh, thank you for hosting us, Paul. And uh, please feel free to hang out, uh, network, uh, visit, make a new friend, whatever. Thank you. See you on February 8th. Thank you. <laughs>